So the next technique I want to at least touch on is the meta-analysis. You've probably already read multiple meta-analyses, and from that you probably determine that what they're basically doing is trying to create statistically a much larger sample size by using multiple studies to aggregate together to look for an overall pattern of behavior or an overall effect size in very similar research. So the main key components of meta-analyses are that they combine multiple studies, they aggregate those studies, and then they affect, they basically estimate the effect size. Now, unlike a lot of our statistical analysis, the actual analysis, the actual math, if you will, among in a meta-analysis is actually very simple. In fact, most of the actual macros or data that you need or statistical techniques or equations are often just done in Excel. The difficulty in meta-analysis lies specifically in the methodology. You have to be very careful in how you run a meta-analysis. And most of the time, you're not as worried about the statistics in this case. You're worried about the method section. So the method section is going to tell you if the meta-analysis is worth paying attention to, much more than the statistical analysis. Um, this is probably one of the most susceptible garbage in, garbage out uh, statistical techniques out there in that because all you're doing is aggregating effect size estimations, the math behind it is fairly simple. It really matters on what you choose to plug in. So again, single studies may not sufficiently allow generalization using all five principles of general, uh, basically general, uh, I just lost my train of thought there, um, general inference. So. When we talk about the five principles of general inference, what we're talking about is, again, can you generalize to different times, different settings, different people, different uh, operations, et cetera? And again, any single study is going to have limitations in that. So one of the ideas behind a meta-analysis is that if you have multiple studies from multiple time periods, from multiple locations, using multiple uh, methodologies, that you start to get a bigger picture, especially if all of them keep finding the same effects. So several studies can give us a much better argument for overall generalization. So the method of for using multiple studies includes programs of research, literature reviews, and meta-analysis. And what I'm just talking about there is meta-analysis is only one technique to do this. Many researchers do the same kind of research over and over and over again. In other words, they have a program of research. They are doing a, one study after another that is in very similar areas and very similar concepts, and they keep doing those studies with slight tweaks. That's what a program of research is. So when you have someone that's been doing research for 20 years, publishing two to three times a year, you end up with a body of research, 20 to 30 studies, using different methodologies over different times, but generally looking at the same psychological construct. So that's one way to build up that knowledge of general causation and also general ability to generalize to larger samples. Anytime we are doing a single study, when we do the literature review, we're effectively doing kind of an ad hoc analysis of previous studies. We're basically saying the research has found this in the past, it's found it in different ways, it's found it in different places, and here's why I think we need to look at it in my particular study. Meta-analysis builds on top of these two techniques to actually make it a systematic analysis of not just a literature review or not just your own personal research, but a combination of factors to where you're looking across mathematically and systematically the research that's been done in this area by hopefully a large sample of researchers. So meta-analyses quantifies the effects of single studies and aggregates them together and form a collective more generalizable result. So there's two things a meta-analysis is usually going to be doing. It's going to be first looking for is there a general trend or a general effect size that is supported and found across most, if not all, studies? And then the second thing it's going to ask is once that effect size exists, are there variables within the types of studies that affect that effect size? So, for example, is that effect size stronger in lab experiments compared to real world experiments? If we're looking at kind of an applied problem in a business setting, are the effect sizes stronger for multinational corporations versus small mom and pop organizations? So not only are we getting an effect size, we're also trying to get a little bit of an idea of the if-then behind that effect size. When is it strong? When is it weak? 
So the unit of analysis is no longer the person, it's the actual study, and the studies are often going to be weighted by sample size. So the bigger the study, the better the study was done, the larger the sample, the more representational that sample is, that is usually going to be weighted stronger in a meta-analysis than a smaller study with a more narrow sample. So criteria for inclusion is the first major methodological question. So how did they actually determine which studies they were going to look at? So which studies are included in their sample of studies? Are they only going to use randomized experiments? Are they going to only use particular studies that looked at a, one particular type of treatment? Are they only going to include studies that have a certain sample size, large or small? Are you only going to include published studies? What are the years of completion of the studies that you're going to include in your meta-analysis? All of these need to be determined, and all of them probably need to be determined based on some previous research, even if it's just a lit review. So, for example, if I was looking at cognitive dissonance, I would probably want to be including years of completion from the start of the theory, so probably late 1950s forward. However, if someone had done a meta-analysis on cognitive dissonance in 1995, looking at 90, 1955 through 1990, then I might want to do a meta-analysis looking at 1991 and on. So again, where are we going to find more information? Where are we not going to be replicating previous findings? All of these come into effect when we're actually running a meta-analysis. If we decide to only use large samples, we're, for example, going to somewhat limit the generalization of our meta-analysis because now we can only say this generalizes to large samples. If we're only using a particular treatment, that's going to, again, limit our generalizability. And also, if we're only using published articles. For the most part, published articles are ones that find significant effects. For our meta-analysis to be trustable, an effort needs to be made usually to find non-published articles, which are becoming easier and easier as theses and dissertations are becoming more and more searchable through various search engines. So once you determine the criteria for including articles, now you need to measure each article. So again, each article represents a data point, a person that we're studying. So we need to create a coding manual that defines the coding scheme. And again, if you're reading a meta-analysis, this is where you really want to dig in. How did they create their coding manual? Who was the ones that were looking at these articles and using this coding? And do you believe the coding truly captured what they're interested in? So we're basically trying to quantify all the information intended that we need to evaluate the study's effects and also how valuable that study was, um, how trustable it was. So what are the variables of interest and how are they measured? Were there covariates? What were the demographics of the sample? And again, we need to be doing this to where we're creating a data set, but instead of measuring individuals, so an individual's demographics and individual's outcomes, we're measuring studies variables of interest, studies covariates, and studies demographics. What happens if there's a problem or discrepancy in coding? So a lot of times some of this is a little subjective and not objective. It's usually done by a panel of people rating these articles once they've been chosen. So coders may interpret results differently. They may argue or disagree, for example, on how rigorous it was or how what various demographics were. Some articles may not provide all the information needed. So information for studies may be insufficient. Some studies may have multiple effects. So some studies may be and uh, effectively have done multiple studies and each study had a different effect size. Generally speaking, if you're looking at a study that's multiple studies, each one of the studies needs to be treated as its own individual data point. And finally, I already talked about, again, the publication bias. So what did they do to find non-published articles? Because if all you're doing is a meta-analysis of published articles, there's a built-in bias that you're going to find effects because only articles that find effects are usually published. Once you've done all this, the actual statistics behind multiple uh, uh, meta-analysis is fairly straightforward. We're basically just going to be looking at effect sizes and quantify the measure of a treatment effect. Meta-analysis tends to standardize effect sizes into a common metric so the studies can be averaged together. So, for example, if you have some studies that are logistic regression, some are multiple regression, some are ANOVAs, some are t-tests, all of those have different effect sizes, correlation as well. So the first process is simply converting them all to one effect size. Um, for better or worse, meta-analysis usually is using the standardized mean difference, or Cohen's D. Um, and again, small effect of 0.2, moderate of 0.5, large of 0.8, and it's usually the difference of means or the relationship between two variables divided by the total variance. 
So once you have that, that's the first step. Again, if you're actually weighting the samples based on the size and representationalness of their samples, you would give greater weight to Cohen's D's from better, larger samples and smaller Cohen Z or weight it less when it comes from a smaller sample. And that is going to become your DV or your outcome of the meta-analysis. Is there an overall effect that can be found across studies? And then the next set of hypotheses are, are those effects altered or different between different conditions of the study? In other words, for example, studies in the 1970s, are they stronger or weaker in their effect size than studies in the 80s or 90s? Um, it might be looking at studies that only looked at men, are they stronger or weaker than studies that only looked at women? So again, we're wanting to ask, are there demographic or feature IVs that we can identify within the studies themselves that we can then create hypotheses at looking at the difference in these effect sizes. So hopefully that gives you an overall concept of meta-analysis and kind of what to look for when you're analyzing a meta-analysis for your own purposes or at least a starting point if you're ever asked to do one. Now the last thing we discussed with interclass correlations, there's some pretty good um, resources online where you could probably put together enough knowledge to run an ICC if you were asked to in an applied setting. I would strongly caution against trying to run a meta-analysis without a fair amount of training. And by a fair amount, I'm talking about credit hours worth of actual classes in meta-analyses. A lot of work has to be done before you ever calculate the Cohen's D to actually have a meta-analysis that is trustable and really is actually adding to the house of science, as it were. So my main goal here is simply to give you enough understanding to kind of have an idea of what a meta-analysis is doing and a little bit of an idea of where to look to determine if you feel confident the meta-analysis did a good job in what it's presenting.